So today I was going to talk to you guys about constipation. Um, and it's like a pretty prevalent condition for so many people. And I just thought that might be one topic in the future. Obviously when listening to these, I always encourage people to reach out either during this or at the end of it or to their front desk to say like, here's, here's some of the things that we'd like to hear about. Um, cause sometimes the stocks get a little like, well, what's next? What should we do? What should we do next? You know? So always feel like if you have these things that come up, please reach out. I always like to answer other people's questions and learn more myself. So, um, so we'll start with this today and let's see. So in general, um, I'm going to talk about how we experience constipation, how all of us can come into the phase of like knowing what constipation is for each of us um, and what transient versus chronic constipation looks like. Why would we end up getting support for it? There's a lot of times we don't end up thinking, hey, we should actually do something about this because it's so normal. Like in our life, a lot of times people have just had this occur and um, never thought anything of it, never thought that there's actually some other way to actually have stools. Uh, and then other factors that can influence constipation, um, how to ID your stool type. So there's like a lovely chart I get to show you all. And for those of us that already seen me, they know what this is. Uh, underlying causes that could be there, um, and then what to consider for treatments or testing in the future, um, and then kind of wrapping it up again. So we'll just go through um, all of those things. So in general, like I was saying, uh, constipation actually affects like individuals uh, in all ways across um, gender, across ages. It can start as young as like infancy for some people male, female, it doesn't matter. And it impacts out people all the way up through uh, late adulthood. Um, so we'll kind of like look through that and start like kind of get a better understanding, like naturally what we can do to help work through that. So different ways we can all experience constipation. Um, the definition of constipation is actually having less than three stools um, three times per week. Um, so, actually having bowel movements less than three times per week. Um, difficulty uh, or straining with each bowel movement can be happening. Um, and then actually the one identifier for just chronic constipation or constipation versus IBS with constipation is whether you have uh, intra-abdominal pain, not necessarily pain right on defecation, but pain that occurs prior to. Um, if you have that, that's actually IBS um, related constipation. Um, so it's one of those crossovers we're going to talk about. Um, so some of us will have just difficulty or straining with bowels and shyness upon stooling. Sometimes people can't go to the bathroom if they leave their house, if they go into another um, area at work and other places, some people can't go to the bathroom there. Some people have a hard time in their own home because they get nervous because other people are around. Um, and that makes it more difficult. Uh, abdominal fullness sensation distension of the belly. You know, I have people report like, yeah, my stomach can actually feel like it's, you know, six or, you know, nine months pregnant. Um, and having that dis dis discomfort from the distension or from the fullness being there. Um, stools and when they're passed, um, they can be usually harder stools and they can even be really large stools that are kind of getting uh, impacted or small, like deer pellets basically is what a lot of people call them. Um, and then hemorrhoids and fissures can often result. So the hemorrhoids are um, actually like changes to uh, vasculature at the rectum, at the opening, um, where that gets uh, expanded and we actually start having those break open at times when we're actually having so much pressure to, down at the rectum. Um, and that often is already there when women have had um, children, when they've had pregnancy. Um, and with people that have jobs where they're sitting at a desk a long time, sometimes that also is occurring. But when people have either diarrhea or constipation, hemorrhoids can result um, and hemorrhoids are more common with constipation picture. Um, and the fissures are uh, occur from um, having stools that are actually too large sometimes. Uh, so we get a little bit of a, a crack in the rectal tissue there that causes pain when we actually um, do have a stool because it's actually pulling that skin apart each time we have a stool. So we start to build up this fear of actually going to the bathroom because of that pain at the same time. Um, people can have incomplete stools where they're having those deer pellets or smaller stools multiple times a day. So then they think, well, I'm not constipated because I'm not waiting for days to go to the bathroom. 
But if there's a tiny deer pellet and we're not actually having a, a complete stool passage and clearance, then that is actually considered constipation. Um, and then there's times that people can actually have um, incontinence where they actually, you know, have stool that actually comes out without control. And they often think, well, no, that's diarrhea. I actually have diarrhea. Well, if they're actually going through episodes of having constipation for a few days to a week at a time, then we can actually start to have stool get impacted or building up at the rectum. And we are still eating food usually. So our body will actually try to liquefy that next layer of stool to actually pass it around the impacted stool. And we don't have much control over that at that point. So we usually have soiling that happens um, from actually having that liquid stool come out. Um, and so that's important to look into as well, because we don't want to have that continue. That's a, not a healthy pattern. Um, and then bloating, bloating, like similar to the distension, bloating can be gas backing up and getting stuck behind all the stool. And then like transient versus chronic constipation. So transient constipation can occur when like people go traveling or take trips if they have short alterations of diet. Um, typically these will resolve within a few days um, or when they return from a, a trip. It's not something that is ongoing for a lot of people. Um, but chronic constipation is something that is occurring ongoing for people longer than three months at a time where you're having disruption of stools, where you're not having them daily or um, having more than like three days between those stools. Some people can go up to one to two weeks sometimes without stooling. Um, that could cause a more significant um, pathology or injury um, over time if that keeps occurring. Um, some of the chronic constipation pictures, we can go over a piece of, pieces of what those occur from, um, but like lifelong constipation since childhood, or sometimes post-injury or other conditions being on board that actually instigate having ongoing con uh, constipation. Medications as well is another huge piece that people often don't know to look at the uh, medications that will actually cause that. Um, chronic constipation can be difficult to treat and there's a lot of different layers to it. So that's kind of where we come in is going through different steps of what have we looked at, what have we done um, and what can we you know, do different. Um, and then schedule and routine are key for people that have chronic constipation. And we'll kind of talk through that a little bit, but making sure that you have time each morning because the normal mornings are normal time for actually having defecation or the urge. Um, so having the schedule where we can actually have that morning time that's free of like high stressors. We're not running late all the time. If we have that morning time to be actually able to go to the bathroom, um, and actually have a space that's comfortable for us to do so, uh, then people actually will have an easier time with managing their constipation. So why get support? Like why look into it if it's like been this ongoing lifelong thing for a lot of people? Um, one, it can actually avoid some of the other complications that can result. Um, some of that is uh, when we actually have constipation, it impacts uh, detox and elimination pathways. So we eat food, the whole process of eating food, we get nutrients, we feed our microbiome in our gut, and then the rest of that is supposed to be passed in stool. With that, we actually also pass any toxins that we've had go through our system that our kidneys or our liver have processed and try to put back out. Um, we have hormones that go through our system regularly, you know, men and women obviously still have detox pathways for excess hormones that need to be flushed out. So there's a lot of different pieces uh, that happen with detox and urine, stool, sweat, breathing. These are some of our main ways of actually detoxifying um, our body. And if stool gets backed up, we actually start to reabsorb those toxins and those hormones or cholesterol. So there's a lot of different conditions that can be resulting because of constipation that's chronic. Uh, and then as far as like hemorrhoids, like physically, we can actually have hemorrhoids um, that start to develop the anal fissures. Hemorrhoids can be resolved to some extent. They are somewhat difficult. We can have internal hemorrhoids right inside the rectal area or external. Uh, and then the fissures um, as well can be really hard because we should hopefully be having, you know, daily or every other day stools. Um, but 
each time we do, we might crack that skin back open a little bit each time. So it takes time to heal those. And then as far as um, <laughs> uh, rectal prolapse, sorry, I was just reading a message trying to make sure I wasn't missing someone. Um, we can actually get a rectal prolapse, which um, is actually where the rectum actually starts to protrude out from uh, the anus, so the opening. Uh, and because we're actually having stool that actually gets built up so much, we start to uh, cause distortion of the tissue um, in the intestinal tract and the colon and the rectal area. Um, so right above the, the anus, we actually have the rectum and that is where uh, stools start to back up and sometimes we'll get distortion of that tissue and that tissue gets lax. So we stop having support there and that actually can prolapse out. Um, so that can become an issue. And then sometimes surgery is needed at that point or other support is needed. Um, we already talked about fecal impaction, that, that the stool um, getting backed up at the rectum and hardening and makes it much more difficult to pass and either physical um, support being maneuvered out of the rectum needs to occur um, because even enemas sometimes at that point are not effective at, with like reducing the hardness of that. Um, and then if we get backed up far enough um, through the colon, we can actually get blockage that occurs. So eventually at some point we are not able to get um, other stool to pass. So getting stool moving on a regular basis is important for a lot of different reasons. And those are just some of them. So these are some of the basic factors like influencing constipation, like daily um, adequate fiber intake. So 28 to 35 grams of fiber is needed for most people to have a good stool passage each day. Um, without that, we don't bulk our stools very well. We don't have water absorption into them to make them easier to pass. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of our like typical uh, standard American diet doesn't contain a lot of fiber. Uh, so the more we can look at whole foods, whole grains, um, legumes and beans, uh, things like that, um, those are great sources of fiber to actually have on board. Um, and then lack of physical activity, uh, that actually, when we think about body movement, body movement, when we're walking, when we're doing exercise, when we're just rolling around, playing with our kids and stuff, all those things actually move the intestinal tract. Um, and walking actually is one of the better ways for a lot of us to get that moving uh, just in a, an easy to access way. Uh, it actually gives basically gentle massage to the internal organs and helps to uh, instigate that movement a little bit for propulsion. Um, insufficient hydration, so being dehydrated is a significant factor for a lot of people. Um, and that can happen for a variety of reasons and whether we're actually having issues with kidney function um, or just staying hydrated um, and getting that in every day uh, for some people is difficult. Uh, and also caffeinated drinks. So like you know, there's kind of different rules about caffeine, whether caffeine actually has this negative because it is uh, dehydrating to some extent, it's an astringent. So astringent means it's going to take fluid away. Uh, so if we have an excess amount of caffeine each day, caffeine causes a stimulant action on the GI tract for urging uh, of stools, but in excess without uh, additional water, we can actually have uh, dehydration occur. So those stools get harder. Um, in their own formation, and then they're more difficult to pass. Um, and then side effects of medications. Like I said, there's a lot of different medications that can cause uh, paralysis or slow transit of the GI tract. Uh, and also some that just cause similarly the dehydration factors. So um, antihistamines are um, dehydrating to some extent. So that's part of the piece of that. So medications that are similar to those. Opioids um, actually are par paralyzing to the GI tract or they slow that movement of the GI tract. So those can all cause uh, constipation, which anybody that's had surgery and had to have um, those medications afterwards is very familiar with. And then stress and emotional factors. And this is one I like to be able to talk with people about a lot. Uh, if we don't, if we're not in a relaxed state, um, just similar like my past um, lectures I've given, if we're not in a relaxed state, we don't digest food. If we're not in a relaxed state, it's more difficult to pass stool. 
um, those movements of the GI tract uh, lessen when we're in a stress state. Um, we don't feel safe. We don't secu feel secure. So think about, just think about a person in the wild. If that's how you developed, you cannot be going to the bathroom if you actually think you're going to be chased by a tiger. <laughs> so just think about it like that. Um, so actually that, that time when I said uh, having a time and a schedule um, and a routine is really important for some people. That's one of those pieces that can actually help aid that. Having that schedule and that routine gives us that safe space and safe time. But also like working on underlying, like, was there fear around stooling before? Or was there um, stressors in your life right now that you just can't get out of your head when you're actually in this space of your own, you know? So there's a lot of um, ways to delve into that, actually, um, with discussion about what's happening in your life. Um, and then underlying medical conditions. These are just a few, there's a, gonna be a list and a note later for others that are um, uh, occur that actually increase constipation, but hypothyroid is a very common condition. Um, IBS and pelvic floor dysfunction, they are very, very common. Um, diabetes is another. So all of them can disrupt how our, our intestinal tract is moving. Um, hypothyroid directly uh, slows transit of the GI tract. So that's part of the reason why that occurs. And then the pelvic floor dysfunction can happen with men or women. Um, and more commonly with women, especially with pregnancy or post-pregnancy. Um, so actually the pelvic floor structure can be disrupted. So with surgeries, with pregnancy, um, and when that's disrupted, then we have a, less function of how we're actually sitting on the toilet, able to defecate uh, and actually the, the nervous system and the muscle, muscle function gets altered. And so pelvic floor therapy, actually that can be done through uh, physical therapists that are trained in that can be really beneficial both for men and for women in this. Um, let's see, this is our lovely stool chart. This is one of my favorite tools to use in office. <laughs> um, and this is the kitty version, but that's fun. So I use it with everybody. But if you look at the stool chart, you can see that there's actually seven types and a lot of different um, gastros and other doctors use this as well to help give us um, an idea of what the patient actually sees. Because if you ask a patient, well, what does your stool look like every day? And most people are like, uh, I don't know, like a sausage, I guess. Um, and so, or soft serve is what I hear a lot too. So, <laughs> so this gives us actually well of like, what does each one look like um, and what do they feel like? So type one and two are more constipation predominant stools. Um, and this is like the type one is like the rabbit droppings, deer pellets that people will say, and they're small. They're difficult to pass because there's no um, dimension to them. They're too small. So for our uh, intestinal tract to actually wrap around it and be able to push behind each of those, it's a little difficult. So people will get like two or three or four out at a time. And each one seems like a, an immense amount of work to try to get out. And that's part of the reason why there's nothing for our intestinal tract to be able to like push. Um, and type two is like a similar, but a whole bunch of those put together. And the piece that occurs sometimes for people with really impacted stools is type two can actually get really bulked. And then it's physically hard to actually get out at that point because it's too um, big to actually pass through. Uh, and then type three and four are like our ideal lovely stools if we can get those. Um, and then five through seven get more towards the loose or um, diarrhea kind of states. And sometimes when we do have fecal impaction from that type two getting too big, then we'll actually get type six or seven where it just kind of gets pushed or it gets liquefied and pushed um, past that, that stool impaction. So these are some of the causes uh, for constipation as far as um, neurogenic disorders like you're gonna see on the left here. Um, that means neurologic issues that can impact uh, how the gut is functioning, how the gut is moving. And then also um, other disorders next to it, the non-neurogenic disorders thinking hypothyroid, hypokalemia, which is actually um, low potassium. Um, it has to do with electrolyte balance. Um, if we don't have potassium and if our electrolytes are off, 
our muscle contractions don't work and the nervous system doesn't work appropriately. Um, anorexia nervosa, where we're not having um, appropriate um, caloric intake um, that affects not only because we're not having food come in, but also because we are impacting so many other areas of like nervous system function and GI function, digestive um, enzyme release, all those other pieces um, get changed with that. Pregnancy impacts it significantly. We have not only have more progesterone, this hormone progesterone on board during pregnancy, which causes uh, smooth muscle relaxation, which that nervous system, uh, the, the intestinal tract is smooth muscle. Um, we also have the baby inside that's actually putting pressure on everything and making things a little bit more difficult. Um, a lot more gravity held down onto the GI tract. Um, and then hypopituitarism, uh, sclerosis, all these other pieces impact muscle function. Um, and then you can see like just a couple different identifiers as like irritable bowel syndrome, a whole bunch of different drugs, um, and any idiopathic, which means non, no causes known, no specific causes known. And we think of either normal transit uh, constipation, where if we did a test, we could actually see that it's going through at the right time, but we're just still having uh, a lesser ability to pass stool or slowed uh, transit constipation where it takes a lot longer to go from stomach all the way down to rectum. Um, and even that in that aspect can cause um, dehydration of the stool as it's going, taking that long to go through. Um, and dyssynergic defecation just means that we actually cannot get um, agreement <laughs> between the muscles um, down towards the rectum that say, I'm going to do this first and then I'll do this. Um, it actually gets off kilter. So we actually aren't able to pass stool effectively. And there's tests to do for that actually too. So there's some of the medications that we're talking about that can cause um, constipation. So the anticholinergics that are at towards the top here, like antihistamines when we have allergies, um, antidepressants, antispasmodics, so sometimes muscle relaxants and things like that. Um, those can all cause more dehydration. So not just, you know, in mouth or whatever, it's causing dehydration throughout our system. So it can actually cause that in the stool too. And um, iron supplements definitely can cause uh, constipation. It's well known for that. Um, so there's other options for like, you know, really focusing on meat-based IV um, injection therapies if needed, if that's such a huge um, complication that um, can't be over, over, overcome. Um, we also have herbal-based iron supplements that are a little bit more um, supportive for that versus like constipating. Um, and then we talk, already talked about some of these others, antihypertensives. So if somebody has hypertension, some of those medications will also cause uh, constipation. So this is a typical logarithm that gastros or other doctors would use to say what's going on how do we find out why somebody has constipation and the first like always when you go into a doctor's office this is like figuring out what happened get a physical exam um get your history about like why it's going on or what when you noticed it starting and then doing labs sometimes doing trials which is also like the first first line of therapy is always looking at the underlying onset and um Fiber, like I said, fiber and water, are like two, two big things. So these are some of the ways that we can actually test and see what's going on for someone. Um, and when I was talking earlier about that dyssynergic defecation, where that our rectum has this hard time agreeing on how it's going to actually work together to actually get movement of that stool out. Um, this test here, and I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, um, but in the middle of this, it has uh, anal rectal manometry and balloon expulsion tests that actually gives, that has to be done through gastros, gastroenterologist. Um, and that one will give us whether that's actually occurring, if that dyssynergia is actually occurring. Uh, and so there's other various pieces that we can look at for why, why it's happening and to actually delve into what is actually happening. And then we go to the why. So, um, so here, like when somebody comes to see me, I'm going to go through some of those same steps. It's uh, just a little bit different thought process. A lot of times 
Um, so really delving into like the same thing, the origin, like when it first started, what are you actually experiencing? How did it progress? Um, things that you've already tried or been given to try and the benefits you've had or not had from those things. Um, and anything that you're actually using now also that's supportive, but you actually have side effects from, because sometimes the side effects are worse than what's, you know, we're getting the benefit from. Um, and then the, also looking at like the, the workup you've done, any imaging or um, testing you've already had done. So we're not duplicating that, obviously. And also lining out what are your goals? Like when you guys come to see me, I always want to know, like, what are your goals? I'll actually share my goals when I get your story too, because sometimes I might see things that you're not aware, like that could be major problems um, or maybe like this step first works better. Um, but always wanting to have that conversation instead of just saying, well, I see this, this is what you have to do. <laughs> That's not how I work usually. Um, and then going over different treatments to consider um, if diet, fiber, water has not been tried and body movement, those are always going to be like my first go-tos. Uh, and then also looking, okay, is there something else underlying? Is there a condition that you have either that is known and not optimally supported or that has not been discovered yet that nobody's been able to figure out? So that's why like that big intake is really helpful because there are so many times that people just keep moving through life because we, we have to, you know, we, we just need to keep going. We need to go to work. We need to take care of our families and um, but we don't actually know like, oh, that fatigue, um, and that hair loss is actually hypothyroid and like, oh, I never knew that, you know, why would you, why should you, <laughs> unless you're able to reach out to other people that have the same syndrome. Um, so having that discussion with one of us is actually helpful or somebody similar. Um, and I always listen to my patients. I love listening to my patients and sharing conversations. So, <laughs> um, and then from there, one of my biggest things is knowing where somebody is in life and uh, function, uh, what their other weight is in life to know their ability to make change and asking that question to know that, can you actually do these things? These are the things I would think that would be the best start, but can you, and let's make some goals because overwhelming a patient and saying, here's all these things, um, doesn't work for them. It doesn't work for any of us. So that's another piece. Um, and also sharing education about why we're doing it is, is super important because I have so many people come in that don't even understand why they've been put on a medication or why they're doing testing. And that's really important to have autonomy and authority over yourself and your body. So, um, so diet and lifestyle, like natural fast, lovely first things that we always like to aim towards. Um, cause our body is an amazing thing that can actually heal itself and work. And that's, that's how it was made. <laughs> uh, so, uh, increasing fiber, uh, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, uh, some of us don't tolerate some of those. That's okay. There's always other choices. Um, nuts and seeds are other options for that too. So if, if some of these things that people will give you, or if I gave it to you at some point, if they don't work, then let's go, let's go back to the discussion find what works. Um, cause if we skip past these steps, if there's not something else overtly underlying and we skip past these steps, then we'll, what usually ends up happening is people put a medication or supplement on board and we could have actually just gone with like nutrition. So if we can get something that's less invasive and better for us and actually feeding us great. Um, and then adequate hydration, plenty of water, unless you have, uh, a kidney disturbance or some other underlying fact, um, condition about half your body weight in water or flu non-caffeinated fluids is usually about the recommended amount. Um, sometimes more if somebody has chronic constipation. Um, and then the other things that are like food-based that actually can help uh, like prunes and prune juice it actually taste good. I always thought when I was a kid that it was like, had to be horrible tasting. Um, cause my parents used to, <laughs> but it actually is a, a supportive laxative. Um, having too much will cause diarrhea for some people, but just having a, a prune or two a day, sometimes for some people, and maybe a little bit of prune juice at night before bed. And usually at night before bed is best, especially with that, um, because the morning urge, you get that laxative effect overnight. And that morning urge helps with getting comboed together to actually have a good morning stool. Um, healthy fats. Uh, there's that low fat craze in the eighties that just like totally made a lot of people deficient. 
Um, but having good healthy fats like olive oil, avocados, avocado oil, nuts, seeds, those kind of fats are actually really good for not only our nervous system health, um, but it's also helpful for lubrication when it goes through the GI tract. So not, we don't absorb all of the fat that we uh, ingest. So some of it will actually help with keeping that stool a little more lubricated as it goes through. Uh, and then limiting processed foods and refined sugars. Uh, those can, one, um, depending on what foods they are specifically, can definitely overfeed uh, microbiome. Um, and usually the more opportunistic not healthy microbiome. We have like all these uh, members of our family and our GI tract of bacteria and fungi and archaea, all these different types of organisms, and they need to be fed. And they actually take a lot of our fibers and actually make all these good compounds to help with health. Uh, but sugars and processed foods don't feed them well. They, they overfeed those opportunistic growths. Uh, so, um, and they don't feed us well either. So in the end, it doesn't serve anybody. So whole foods. Uh, again, regular physical activity is really important. Uh, getting up and moving your body multiple times a day, having a good walk minimally is going to be uh, really supportive for people's digestive function. Um, establishing the routine that we talked about. Um, and routine and uh, daily diet sometimes is actually also a big thing where more and more research is coming out about circadian rhythms, which is day to night rhythm and what we do in those days and nights. Uh, so when we get up in the morning, having our wake time and our, our sleep time be similar each day within a half an hour to an hour of like when we're going to bed and when we're waking up, if possible, some of us have schedules that are like altering, which just makes it more difficult, but those are pieces that are important for our body to recognize, when am I waking? When am I gonna eat my first meal? When am I gonna eat this next one? When am I actually having these things coming um, into my body uh, and know what to do with it? Uh, bodies are really much more healthy with routine. Bodies and minds, I'll say that too, bodies and minds. Uh, blood sugar regulation is really important with um, how we feel each day and how we manage our day. Um, and that makes a big difference too with how, what our eating patterns are like. And if somebody says, oh, I go to the bathroom every day in the morning, but when I actually skip a meal or something like that, then I don't go until later in the afternoon. Then I start having constipation for two or three days. So sometimes that can be a trigger for some people as actually missing those meals um, that are normally regular. Uh, and then stress management is such a big one. And with our society, um, I think that what I would love to do someday is just have a clinic that is all sit down. We're going to sit down at that picnic table outside and that's what we're going to do for our visit <laughs> or take a walk in nature. Um, because stress management shouldn't have had, a, should not have been a word that we had to create. <laughs> um, but it is, it is something that we have. Um, and we're so busy with our lifestyle. If we can actually get our, our stress resilience back up, and that usually is with being able to ground ourselves, being able to give ourselves downtime because our bodies and minds are not made to go at hyper speed. They're not meant to be in constant function and um, engagement with what do I need to do? I need to answer this. I need to get back to this person. Um, I need to read this article constantly. Uh, I need to watch TV. I mean, even those, all that is constant stimulation instead of being able to just sit and be calm and look at your meal that you're eating that time and be present with eating your meal, each meal you eat. And that's really difficult for a lot of people. Um, but then there's also levels of like, people are in a more high stress relationship or a high stress work environment. And that impacts our digestive function significantly, which impacts our stool regularity. So that's always a, uh, a discussion in every office in this clinic. <laughs> Uh, and then herbal teas can help with, uh, managing symptoms and actually supporting movement of the GI tract. So peppermint, ginger, or chamomile are some of the ones that are actually really calming for the GI tract, um, can actually reduce some of that abdominal pain and bloating. Um, ginger actually is really supportive with actually stimulating, uh, 
movement. It's called the migrating motor complex. It's like that sweeping wave. And I can kind of explain that a little bit. I explained it with one of my SIBO lectures before, but um, we have peristalsis, which is like this big wave, this bolus that moves food through all the way down to the rectum to stooling. Um, and then we also have migrating motor complex that is between meals in a fasted state and at night in a fasted state. And it's just a sweeping wave that goes down from mouth all the way to the rectum to like sweep debris and bacteria down to try to keep our microbiome in the right place and also not have overgrowth occurring. Um, ginger is one of those things that's called a prokinetic that actually helps stimulate and support that. So if we do have disruption with nervous system function in the GI tract, ginger can be one of those pieces that might be helpful. Um, it is also anti-nausea um, and it's actually a digestive stimulant. So it has all these different functions and chamomile as well. So it's very calming to the GI tract. It's anxiolytic um, and it's um, helpful with uh, calming any gas and bloating. So um, magnesium and vitamin C are gonna be those extra pieces that we might put on place to actually keep stools uh, loosened up with having hydration in them. They are called osmotic laxatives. So they're used for obviously other reasons, but certain forms of magnesium like oxide and citrate, those are the chelate versions of them, um, actually help draw water into that stool so that it's easier to pass. Uh, vitamin C does the same thing in higher doses. So sometimes when you actually hear somebody say, oh, I took a whole bunch of vitamin C and I had massive diarrhea, that's why. We only absorb so much at once, the rest of it draws water into the stool and actually kind of helps flush things out. So sometimes if we are having a hard time, um, those are one of the least invasive, one of the, one of the least lesser invasive supplements to use to actually help people get easier to pass stools. So until we get other things corrected, or if we cannot get things fully corrected, those can be ones that can be helpful for that. Um, and then there's a lot of different probiotics. Um, I don't have people on probiotics all the time. Um, over, over abundance of oral probiotic use, I think causes more issues and there's more data coming out that it, we can actually cause overgrowth from actually too many, having too many on board all the time. But for certain conditions and in certain like microbiome, populations than we do. And it can be really helpful uh, con for constipation specifically, uh, saccharomyces and um, spore-based probiotics can be really helpful. Um, and then, like I was saying earlier with fiber, so this is kind of still like supplement base, um, it's food supplement base, but flaxseed ground or chia um, added each day into either smoothies or water or I put some on salads sometimes or in soups. Uh, those actually give you fiber and great omega-3 fatty acids. So um, good balancing of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids at that point. So then in some of the other common conditions, uh, if every if other things have been ruled out as far as um, pathologic issues um, with uh, other conditions or um, infections that are overt or that a gastro or a primary care might find out, um, we start looking at these pieces as well. So after all those have either been like kind of looked at and, and seen, um, or if these are much more, if your symptoms your, and your complaints match these more, then I will look here first. Uh, but SIBO is one of them, that's small intestine bacterial overgrowth. And then part of that is also intestinal methanogen overgrowth or IMO. So that can result um, and cause uh, constipation, bloating, gas, sometimes diarrhea. Um, and those, and there's a lot of other pieces that go with dysbiosis, like we were talking about earlier, constipation and dysbiosis, which is like that imbalance of the microbiome. So those are conditions I would look at to test and to see are those on board because we can do treatment for them. Um, when we, if people are diagnosed with the IBSD, which is diarrhea or IBSC constipation, um, and there's also IBSM, which is basically mixed um, of those two, about 60 to 80% is, is resulting from SIBO or IMO. And there's still not a lot of uh, information or educate. There's information out there, but there's not a lot of education gained yet by other docs, um, unless you're specializing it. So the information's there, the data's there, 
the validity is there. It just takes 10 or 15 years for it to get out. Um, and so those are kind of things that I have specialized in because um, it's pretty prevalent because there's a lot of people out there with IBS and no other res resolution for what's going on with them. And that's part of it. And you can do treatment and you can um, either work with underlying causes or trying to regrow and rebalance that microbiome. And then general dysbiosis, um, you can look for that too. If it's not SIBO or IMO, if it doesn't seem like that pattern as much, there might be other patterns of overgrowth from those opportunistic bacteria or even commensal, which are the good bacteria in our gut. In our gut. Some of those can actually be overgrown as well. And sometimes it happens from having too much uh, of a probiotic. So, and then candida or fungal overgrowth is also another one that um, is prevalent and it causes constipation predominance normally, but uh, it can cause actually loose stools that causes gas and bloating. Um, and people generally don't feel great when they have that. So. And so some of the teeth testing we do that relates to these is the SIBO or IMO uh, lactulose breath test that we do in office. Um, there's a comprehensive stool test. And when you look for, if, I, if I'm suspecting that or some other kind of overgrowth, I will do a comprehensive stool test. And that test actually covers not only like microbiome to some extent, but more specific to large intestine, but we do extrapolate it to the small intestine because there's not a great way to test small intestine yet. Um, but that actually also gives us digestive markers and inflammatory markers specific to the GI tract. So it gives us a lot of data to work with and figure out why something might be happening and how to help support that person. Um, lab core blood and stool testing, obviously we do here also. Uh, food intolerance testing is done a lot to help give somebody a gauge on like if they can't figure out what food, every food seems to trigger them. Um, if I feel that's helpful, then we can run that to give them a starting point for like, okay, we can remove some of these foods to see if we can get your immune system to calm down and uh, like help uh, seal up um, gut and to figure out why that's happening. Um, but people can have constipation also from foods. Um, often dairy is one of them. Um, and then blood type testing, Dr. Hunter loves doing blood type testing and blood type diet. And a lot of people do find good benefit with that. Um, and then other pieces, uh, if I feel that there's some other conditions that are needing support that I don't treat directly, um, I do referrals. So physical therapy, um, pelvic floor support, massage and acupuncture can be really helpful for people. Like abdominal massage in general can be helpful, um, especially if somebody's had uh, adhesions from surgeries. There's a specific massage that can be done to help reduce those adhesions. It's called visceral work, visceral therapy. Um, acupuncture, um, acupuncture works in so many other ways too, just like massage where we are calming the nervous system as well. Um, so that makes a big difference too. Um, hydrotherapy and colonics can be helpful. Uh, and then gastros or other, if I need other testing, imaging, workup done, I definitely will use a gastro to get that done so I can actually have that data to work with that patient. So, and let's see. So in general, as we like constipation can occur like at any age and with any gender, it's usually three stools per week or less. Um, and it doesn't usually cause significant intestinal pain. If it did, then I would be looking at IBS-C, which is a little different. Um, like you said, it can be transient and resolve within a short amount of time. It can be chronic. Um, chronic constipation causes really significant disruption to your quality of life because we are working around when I have to have my stool, I have to have my time in the morning. I can't go out to, into public sometimes because I'm not sure if I'm going to have to have a stool finally after three to five days. Um, and I want to be able to do that because I'm really uncomfortable. Um, and sometimes like what foods, like if we have to control what foods we're eating constantly and not knowing why, um, and that's how we control our stool pattern, then that makes it difficult to be around others. And if we're just uncomfortable because it's been three to seven days or whatever, before we've had, since we've had a stool, um, we're not going to want to go out and go to other people's homes. Um, it's hard to work sometimes when you're actually uncomfortable like that too. Uh, so the big piece too, with knowing like, when do you seek 
uh, further care is if you know that you're getting impaction um, because impaction we don't want to continue because it makes it much more difficult uh, to resolve once it actually starts to get impacted. So the sooner you get support on board, the better. Um, knowing that there's underlying factors that can cause uh, uh, constipation and that there's actual possible treatment for them. Um, so adjusting diet, medication, increasing body movement, um, getting workup done with testing and imaging if needed, and undergoing treatment. And also know, which is the hard part sometimes, is like if it's taking you years to get to this stage, it's going to take years sometimes to get out. And sometimes that's also because not only are we trying to reverse physiology, like how our body's responding, we're also changing habits. And that is very hard for us to do sometimes. So it's a matter of patience and actually holding into the truth of like, I want to get better and I want to have better function in my life and better quality of life. And that's where my commitment to you is always there because I want to be able to help support that. <laughs> so I, um, been there, done that. So I want to help that. So as far as that, that's what I have for everybody today. I hope it was helpful. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And like, if anybody has questions, please go ahead and unmute or send me a chat, um, ask questions, because it's only going to help everybody if you do. So does anybody have questions? <laughs> Is, would you say that constipation or diarrhea is easier to treat? Huh. Or does it just depend? That it is the just depend. It depends. Uh, underlying cause, like, yeah. you know, we will get underlying cause and kind of piece like that. So what underlying factors still need to be uh, resolved? Um, if, if chronic constipation has been on board for a very long time, that can be difficult to resolve if all these other pieces have already been tried. So sometimes if I work with someone and they actually haven't tried consistently, including fiber, movement, water, then sometimes it's a lot easier than what anybody realizes. Um, right. But that physiologic response um, and actually uh, what happens in the intestinal tract and how we move um, might have to be overcome as well. And so, yeah, it does, it does make a difference on like what, what's going on, why, why people are having it. Yeah. It's a good question. I wish I had a, a, a beautiful answer for that, but. <laughs> no, I think it's a great answer. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Somebody asked, uh, wondering about how periods might possibly or directly affect digestion. Always less regular or more uncomfortable in bowel movements around the time of monthly cycle, monthly cycle. Um, so one of the pieces that we actually know is like when we're actually going through menstrual um, menses, and depending on which stage of the cycle, but during the flow, you can have more inflammation for one thing. We also have different hormones coming out at that point. So progesterone is higher right before we have uh, menses. Progesterone, like I said, is a smooth muscle relaxant. So that impacts uh, the intestinal tract uh, motility. So it slows transit for some people. Uh, some people actually have diarrhea more when they're actually going through their menses. And there's different pieces about like, well, is it inflammation? Because the inflammation from uterus to colon, when they're right, touching each other inside the abdominal cavity and that pelvic floor area, uh, chemical compounds don't stop here and not go here. They cross over. So there's always a little piece of that involved too. And also for some people, if they have any kind of anxiety response, um, that can either go constipation or diarrhea for that. So um, hopefully that helped answer that. If you have more of a question on that, let me know. But putting stuff on board ahead of time for that, sometimes knowing that's your pattern can be helpful. So some of those things we talked about might be helpful and you're welcome. Yeah. Anybody else have questions? Okay. Well, I appreciate you all coming and um, I hope this was helpful. And if you have questions that you, that come up afterwards, you're always welcome to reach out via email, especially if you're like a patient right now and send a message through the portal system. Um, 
and yeah, and I always appreciate if anybody has topics or things they want to talk about, like I said before, to go ahead and send them over or call them in and say, you know, this is for Dr. Misty or this is for the docs for their open forum. So, all right. You all have a great day, okay? Thanks, Dr. Misty. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming too.